Dr. Bondar's work appears on National Geographic, Discovery Worldwide, TED, Animal Planet, Netflix, and the Science Channel. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here this evening. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm delighted to see so many of you in the audience. Um, this is such an important topic. And this, this whole field, this line of work that I do, science communication, is something that I feel has exploded enormously since the pandemic. And we're going to get to that quite a bit. Um, and we're going to get to also how here in British Columbia, the powers of science communication served us very well uh, with our provincial health officer, Bonnie Henry. And in fact, you know, that led to us doing pretty well across the country. So anyway, today, what I really want to focus on is how can we, as you know, stewards of good information, as Rotarians, as students, um, as faculty members, as people who are interested in legitimate information, how can we arm ourselves both with the knowledge to, to really help our own selves access good information online, but how can we take this into society? Like, the reason that I designed this talk is that I think we, everybody who sees this talk, your responsibility will now be to share um, because these ideas are not terribly complex, um, but they are consistent through science and through you know, the pursuit of good information. And so that is my hope. And so I, I love people to share ideas. Um, let me know if you have questions as we go. I, you know, if you have examples. It's um, because this is a, a community-inspired series, it's wonderful to be able to apply what I'm talking about here to things that are relevant to you today to your families, to your children, um, maybe to families that are far away somewhere. So in that vein, oh, yes, I thought I had a mic on. Is it, is it, does it, can I turn it up or turn it on maybe? Uh, is that, do I do that? <laughs> oh, this one. Oh, I see. It's not this one. Oh, I see. I have to stand here. Is that what I have to do? Oh, OK. I just didn't know that. Oh, OK. I have to stand here by the microphone. OK. I'm a walkie talker. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, boy. This is going to be hard, but I will try to stay here at the desk. Oh, my goodness. I apologize to all of you who did not hear the first part of my talk. But uh, what, we, what I'm really want, wanting us to do is, is to just embrace simple techniques, simple ways that we can, that we can uh, share good information online and, of course, with our families and our friends uh, in simple conversation. All right, let me move this mouse. That's going to help. Oh, is there a clicker? Like a, oh, I guess I don't need that because then I'd have to walk. Okay, never mind. Oh, this is very jarring. Okay, there we go. There we go. Okay, so terms, terminology. Fake news, misinformation, pseudoscience, propaganda. I, I wanted to start with a word cloud because probably you, you are familiar with some of these terms. Maybe you haven't seen all of them. Maybe some of them you're seeing for the first time. All of these really are the same thing. Pseudoscience is outright deceit. It just is. That's it. There's no sort of pseudoscience. It's good science or it's not. And so, um, yeah, for me, understanding just how each of these words may find its way, even if it is tiptoeing very, very quietly, um, may find its way into your media. For the, for the most part, um, well, we'll talk about many examples, but we're seeing these things all over. Um, digital media, print media, magazines, blogs, you name it, it's out there. Um, okay, so. In my career thus far, um, I would say that developing a class teaching science communication has been a real highlight for me. And this figure here is something that I go over <laughs> with my science communication students like on day one. Um, and in fact, last week I was uh, speaking to a group of science communication students in Manitoba 
And um, they were talking about these exact ideas as well. This figure is not uh, proprietary. These ideas are readily available, and I really, really sh encourage people to share this figure or to make a version of this figure uh, of your own, in your own language, uh, that will resonate with people in your circles. Um, so what I'm going to do, actually, for, this, for the rest of the talk is to break this down into each of its parts. Um, and we're going to go over exactly what each of those parts means. And we're going to look at some examples. And my hope is that by the end of the lecture, you will feel well armed to go ahead and use these principles on your own as well. So right off the hop there, science is willing to change with new evidence. I feel like during the pandemic, the first thing we ran up against was a gross misunderstanding of science because the general public lost its faith in science because we didn't get it right right away, right? There was a lot that we learned. And science, of course, is this iterative product process. We're going to go through that. Um, but science is always willing to change. We rarely, if ever, talk about proving something. I mean, in math, they do, I guess. Uh, but for the most part, you know, we still remain uh, in discussion of the theory of evolution, the theory of gravity. And that is because, really, the only thing that science ever does is provide support for a hypothesis. Or not. That's it. So did this science support an idea that I had, or did it not? And so with science, of course, the more we learn, the more we, we know. And because of that, it, it can change. Now, pseudoscience can be readily picked out from a crowd <laughs> or from a media post because it's fixed. There's, there's an answer. It's clear. It usually costs something. <laughs> and it's, it's absolutely beyond a shadow of a doubt proven. That's a red flag for you right there. Nothing is ever proven. So somebody's telling you something is 100% foolproof, that's a lie right there. OK, ruthless peer review. Oh boy, we're going to talk about peer review. Because academics, oh boy, it's a love-hate relationship, I'll tell you what. But anyway, peer review is necessary. And peer review is what makes science science. We check each other's work. And we do so with ruthless abandon. I mean, such that there is this myth, or this no, not myth, of um, this this running, you know, joke of reviewer number two, you know, who is this jerk who lives across the planet from you and is studying the exactly same thing as you, and your papers always get sent out to this mythical reviewer two, right? I see some academics laughing in the crowd who who really just hates it, makes you change everything, doesn't like the way you did your stats, and really needs you to redo everything you did. And well, that's a bit of a long story, but you get the idea. And that's why science is believable. Because we check our work, and we do not publish it. We will not publish it unless it is checked. Um, that's, it. that's the third one there. We're going to get to this. Taking into account only favorable discoveries. This is a big one with pseudoscience, huge. Cherry picking, little tiny pieces of a pie that are going to tell a story that works for you. So we're going to get good at telling that. Uh, invites criticism instead of seeing it as a conspiracy. Getting verifiable results versus non-repeatable results. Uh, limiting claims of usefulness. I love scientists because really that is all we ever do. Oh, but there's another study. We need to do another study. So don't believe what I said. There's going to have more work has to be done. Uh, we are notorious for limiting claims of usefulness. So careful. Again, that's that confidence factor. Um, and then lastly, we're going to spend a bit of time at the end talking about accuracy versus precision, what they mean and how they are used and where you won't see them, okay, versus ballpark measurements. Uh, okay, so before I jump into that, <laughs> I want to just basically introduce this thing, which I'm sure needs no introduction to, to the crowd. This is the scientific method. And I've been doing these uh, STEM workshops with uh, girls in the 11 to 14 age group. 
this year um, as part of a grant that I got from here, from this university. Yes, that's really celebrating young girls in science. Um, and this is what we do. We sit in a, in a workshop setting and we talk about what this is and what it means because kids are doing this every day. Kids are observing things. Hey, I saw that thing. Oh, what color is that thing? Why is that thing growing there? Why did that thing fall? All of these things are actually an observation, which could then lead to a, a hypothesis where you simply ask a question about the thing you observed. You then do an experiment of some kind. And you know, your experiment can look, sure, it can look like a you know, white lab coat uh, in your lab with all of your repeated uh, measures and so on, or it can look very different. It can be out in the field, uh, it can be an observational study. There's lots of things you can do, but you will um, do your experiment, you'll draw some conclusions from the results that you got, and then you'll do that thing. Remember that thing? You're either going to support that hypothesis or not. That's it, and you're gonna keep going. And that's basically science. And so, because of this very standardized set of rules, set of steps, I guess, it's like a recipe for how it goes, we can be sure that scientists, you know, here in Chilliwack, across the world in China, uh, you know, across the world again in the South Pacific, are doing science according to the scientific method, period. That's how simple it is. And that's how we know when people are not doing science according to the scientific method. So you see how we kind of, as citizen scientists, we have to become familiar with how it works. Because when we kind of understand how it works, that's when we can help other people understand how it does work. Um, okay, so here's a couple of, of questions that I always like to tag on there. Um, could your experiment be done by someone else? Because part of that experimental, or excuse me, part of that scientific method is writing up. You know, how did you do it? What did you do? Could somebody else look at it and repeat it? And will they get a similar result? Again, it's all measures of peer review. All right, so where, <laughs> where are we going to see some of these ideas in society? Let's start with number one there. Fixed ideas. What is this? I hear it, astrology. Yeah, astrology. Okay, we see astrology a lot in society. You know, we probably everybody knows their birth sign. I'm a Taurus. Um, now, astrology, you know, where you go and you get your horoscope and you learn about what's going to happen for you in that day. Well, that's a fixed idea, right? Because you're actually reading your horoscope to find out what's true about you for that day, <laughs> what's, what's supposed to be happening to you and so on, right? So that is your guarantee. There's your fix right there. Now you know. Oh, hold on. That can't possibly be science because it's telling me something that's fixed. Okay, so anything that, uh, that is predicted in that way, we have to know that that isn't science. Um, because, you know, somebody could uh, write that horoscope, but then what if, uh, what if they, you know, got sick and couldn't come to work that day and somebody else came and wrote that horoscope? Would that mean new evidence? <laughs> How would that work? So that's a really good example for me of a fixed idea. Does anyone have another one that you can think of from your life? Or, um, you know, if you have any, I I'm happy to, you know, don't be shy. I, I know it can kind of be a little bit daunting, but if you have them, definitely feel like you can chat them out. Um, okay, let's talk about this thing called peer review a little bit more. Um, scientific journals are these things that you may often hear journalists referring to uh, if they're doing their news reports and so on. And this is where, generally speaking, academics publish what they do. And from these, you know, magical journal things um, generally come a lot of news media stories about science, written books about science, syntheses, and so on and so forth. But that is called the primary literature. And it has that title because it's sort of like the horse's mouth. That's where the science information is, the beginning, you know, the, the mouth of that river. I guess maybe that's the end, but anyway. Um, and so because of these journal articles having this very, very prestigious and high level existence 
of the thing that scientists share their work within, we must take that very seriously, and we do. Um, generally speaking, when scientists go through and do that scientific method, uh, if it was me during my PhD, I was in uh, the research forest in Maple Ridge, um, manipulating little combinations of crayfishes and leaf packs in stream enclosures, and uh, I was having a grand old time in there, uh, and I did all of that work, got all of my results, wrote them all up into a paper, and then you gotta submit it, right? And each journal has these very, very specific instructions, and I swear it's, that's where they weed out half the scientists right there, because you gotta follow these very, very specific instructions. And then you send it off to the journal, you know, to the specific one that applies to your work, and you wait. Because then what they'll do is they'll get it, and then they'll send it out to other researchers in the field. Check this work, please. Make sure that this sounds good. Could be, you know, could be good, could be not. Then the reviews come back and you either get it published or you don't. And, you know, journals have a ridiculous uh, turnaway rate. I think nature, the big ones, science and nature, I mean, less than a thousandth of a chance, I think, that you would actually get published by, you know, just sending something there. So, I, I mean, but then that creates an entirely new problem all of its own. So there are hundreds of journal titles, but they will all share this same characteristic of people in your field validating what you did, okay? And now that you know that, you can't unknow that, okay? <laughs> okay. Okay, cool. Now, in that vein, because if you are really talking about communicating science, the only currency you should really be using is your journal articles. It's like your money. Okay, so in that way, I always want to see that citation. I want to know where did that published journal article appear. And that is what I mean, and you know, generally speaking, people mean when uh, we refer to the citation. Now, uh, journals are the first thing on that list. There are some titles of the, of the big ones there, Science, Nature, the Royal Society ones, New England Journal of Medicine, etc. Now, other factual sources that are peer-reviewed include NGO reports, so non-governmental organizational reports, um, will be contributed to by multiple nations, therefore becoming a, a measure of peer-reviewed in, in their own selves, in, so to speak. And in uh, the World Bank, the WHO, uh, is included in that category as well. Now, <laughs> government reports, that's funny. I mean, it's not funny. You would hope you would hope, right? You would hope that government reports um, will be factually correct and legitimate. That's the aspirational hope. And if they are legitimate, no problem, they should be peer-reviewed. So if you have a government report that is not peer-reviewed, you gotta get out your skeptical flag. You just do. Maybe they didn't have the time to peer review it, that's fine. It could be, you know, maybe, maybe it was just a report for something that they were doing to create a thing, fine. Not peer reviewed though, keep that in mind. Uh, okay, government reports, industrial reports, okay, of course. So science, uh, contributing to any kind of industry, whether you are in engineering, uh, manufacturing, any kind of the health sciences, dentistry, any industry is going to have an enormous number of industrial reports, and these are generally uh, factually uh, correct and utilized for professional reasons. Not necessarily something that pseudoscience is going to be based on, um, but just so that you know, that's another uh, source that's out there. Generally, um, when books are published by university publishers, it is uh, a way to get their own academics and other academics work out to greater audiences. So those are generally um, pretty safe. Uh, careful with your, with your uh, big publishers though, and they're nonfiction, because nonfiction is nonfiction. That doesn't make it science. So keep that in mind. Uh, we're gonna look at some examples in a little bit. Um, now, the reason I, I included these two images here, I, I like reading or I like uh, the BBC. I, I have a couple of different media 
uh, outlets from each country that I most prefer. So BBC is uh, really nice. PBS, I enjoy NPR, certainly CBC. Um, Al Jazeera English actually is excellent. Really, really enjoy a lot of their coverage as well. So BBC here does a really good thing. Um, when they refer to a journal article, they link directly to it. Okay, so there's your BBC piece and it says scientists say talking to them and then just clicking right on that takes you to the actual peer reviewed journal. Yes, that is excellent. That is what we want to see. And of course, then you, you definitely want to check it. You don't want to necessarily read it uh, word for word because of course that's not really what we came for. But you see that it's there and that legitimate citation will save you a lot of headaches. Um, for simply, or you know, a lot of misinformation, I suppose you could say, uh, for just knowing to look for it. Okay, let's talk about some not factual sources. And this isn't to say that some of these sources can contain good scientific information. Look for the citation. Check for the citation always, okay? Private companies, <laughs> come on, private companies. We live in a world where capitalism rules the day and trade secrets mean a lot, right? Uh, patents and so on and so forth. And there's a lot of information that doesn't make its way to the general public because, well, of course, it's private and proprietary and so on. Now, these private reports, these private, oh, I don't know, all kinds of, you know, this is the state of the of our industry. That's a big one. Careful for those. They look really good. They look really fancy and pretty. Um, anything that a private company is giving you that is informational, in my opinion, should have a citation. And if it is their own work, that doesn't change it. It should still be published if it is legitimate. And actually, you know, people that I, uh, for example, a friend of mine who has a, a hydrogen fuel cell company, maybe you, many of you in Rotary know him, um, they publish all the time in high level journals because they are doing excellent scientific work and what they are doing is changing the industry and it is also good science. So they don't have a problem showing you or, well, who knows? I don't know about that kind of thing in terms of agreements and whatever, but the science is there, okay? So definitely uh, push back on that. Now, religious materials can be, they can be legitimately scientific. So if they do have a, a citation from a journal, and at times they can and do, that is passable. If you don't see a citation, that is not a scientific source, period. Period. Even though there are fancy websites, all kinds of you know high-level people who will give information as though it's the truth. Websites. Uh, students in my classes. Oh boy. I hope everybody does this. But a website is not a source. It's just not. A website is not a source ever. So I saw this. Anybody can do anything on the internet. <laughs> That's just the truth, right? And so, if you read it on a website, nope, just no. That doesn't mean it's not good. Find the citation on what they're saying on the website, okay? Websites, it's just, a, it's basically anybody in the entire world can put a website down anywhere. Okay, uh, oh, this is a big one, this next one. This is, wow, I, I'm interested in sociology. I, I would love to talk to some sociology people about the nature of influencing. Because there's this whole new set of people. This, this job didn't exist before. <laughs> this wasn't a job in, in the sense that it is currently. Before social media, right? So influencers. Influencers are people who are, you know, charismatic and, and uh, presenty. Well, kind of like... <laughs> Kind of like someone else I know, but they, um, well, they become really famous on social media platforms, right? They, they know how to get the shot. They, they're fun. You know, we all probably spend far too many <laughs> minutes of our day uh, scrolling through things like this. Influencers 
do not have any need to be good at anything. So influencers have unfortunately been playing and continue to play a huge role in the spread of bad information. Um, I, and this is a tricky one. This is a tricky one for society because some influencers actually do take their roles very seriously if they are in um, the environmental sciences field, for example. One of the classes that I um, created and teach here at UFE is about sustainable fashion and sort of the, the, the gross, massive ills of sustainable fashion. Dr. Stefania Pizzirani is also uh, the one who created that course with me. Um, and in this course, we have, of course, fashion influencers. We have this confluence of people who are providing information to other people about shopping and buying the next outfit and getting the next thing. And it's this gamified, shopified, self-esteem nightmare for our young people. But outside of all of that, there are still good influencers. And the reason I'm telling you this story is because um, through my class and through a directed study student that I had who was really, really good at media, um, Cameron James, she, she and I connected with one of these influencers um, out of LA who is doing great posts. And we were able to say to her, hey, we like what you're doing. Here's some, you know, here's some peer-reviewed stuff that we like using. And, and she's elevated her game now, uh, this influencer in LA. And I, I love that story because influencing is something that we're still learning about. Influencers who are talking about health products um, you know, supplement type of products. There's all kinds of mind-mending, you know, shroomy type of things out there these days. There's all kinds of things out there. Who are these influencers? And what are they talking about? If they're talking about peer-reviewed science, super. Check. Um, okay, and yes, <laughs> last one, anything you read online without a citation. This is just it, really, if I had one, um, one minute to give this lecture. It would just be that bottom part there. Find the citation. If you can't find that citation, it's fake. Assume it's fake. You have to in today's world. <laughs> We're getting far too close to almost parody with, with good information and bad out there, uh, depending on the platform, okay? Um, and is that citation a good citation based on what you now know about what good, so good sources are? Because if it's not, Refer to step one. Okay. This is um, a clip that I found from Harper's Bazaar, but you know, very popular global magazine, August, 2023. Now I use this one because, well, a few reasons. Um, Beginner's Guide to Crystals. Crystals. Okay, cool. That's not to say that geology is not an awesome field. It is, it's great. Uh, that's not what this Crystals to Manifest book is about. Um, so I, uh, I saw those two names, right? Because that's, there's our influencer piece. There's our, and you know, it's, so Hollywood Celebrity is another sort of layer of that influencer piece. But we've got Victoria Beckham and Miranda Kerr, both really, you know, very globally known uh, women touting this thing. Cool. Not scientists. Laura, did Victoria Beckham get, is she a scientist? Uh, she isn't, I'm just being silly, but, uh, but, that, but how many young people, right? How many people that you know in your life that are maybe feeling down on themselves or something, that are looking for something, that might actually click on that, right? Okay, so then I did. I, I just went ahead and clicked it. I was like, all right, what is this book? So there is the, the title of it there. It says, Harness the Power of Crystals and Start Living Your Best Life. Sounds awesome. Um, so Emma Lucy Knowles is the author, and she is allowed to be an author, right? She is not breaking the law. Uh, it says about the author there, Emma Lucy Knowles. Am I doing that? <laughs> oh my God, I'm so sorry. You guys just tell me when I'm doing things like that. Oh, it's so hard to be me. <laughs> just a second. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. How long was I doing that for? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, right? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so Emma, let's learn about Emma. 
Emma is an intuitive hands-on healer, clairvoyant and meditation teacher. Yes, she is, guys. Uh, she has worked with crystals and energy for 15 years. Hmm. She, uh, let's see here, helping people and souls from all over the world heal their pain, find joy, and achieve success. Now, I'm being a bit silly here, but there's a lot of people in the world that don't get this. And I think that we all have a role to play in not, you know, not even making it silly. Not even. But looking for the citation. That we can do without really causing too much trauma to anyone, right? Um, so let's just think about Emma. No science education, no degrees or certifications that I saw. They did say that she had 15 years of experience with crystals and energy. So do I. Probably all of us do, haven't we? Right? We are all experienced with energy. We are alive. It's fantastic. Okay, so, but read those things. Because that's an author bio, a published author of a major book that Victoria Beckham said you should read. Okay? All right, let's keep going. Here's one from close to home. Um, this is interesting. And actually, I, I wanted to, I gave this, this lecture at Pacific Institution a couple of weeks ago. And um, the one thing that I felt like it really needed is a few more examples, just sort of recent. How does this affecting our lives in Canada, in British Columbia, elsewhere? Okay, so this is a, 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 an article that came out um, in CBC. Pseudoscience, this new study done by uh, this U of A professor and 13 other co-authors, uh, actually wrote a report about a report. So it was this government report that had been uh, done about safe consumption sites, so drug, drug sites, uh, safe consumption usage. The study that was commissioned was not peer reviewed. And that should have killed it right there, right? So a lot of action, I mean, I didn't go into the, to the, all the details of it, but actions were taken, you know, substantial in the province of Alberta based on this report that was not peer reviewed. And now, uh, 14, 14 academics, right, scientists are saying no, 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 no and they're fighting back. So that's, right? That's kind of like, oh, hold up. Peer review, that's just a simple rule, simple rule. Is it peer reviewed, okay? So that was the problem with that study, and that was just last month. Here's another one from British Columbia. So this one I, I think is interesting for a couple of reasons. This comes from the BCCDC, so the British Columbia Center for Disease Control. And this is a blog post that, uh, you know, it's written by a journalist, and it is, you know, she's, she's candid, and she says it's an interview with the principal investigators, or PIs, as they are known, uh, for a BC CDC study assessing the equity of misinformation and communication on COVID-19 in BC. BC CDC study, okay. I couldn't find the study, and I really wanted to find it. The link is bad. Um, but it suggests to me that that's an internal study. And the BCCDC is, you know, full of people who are doctors and medical researchers. And they probably did not have the time to send that out for peer review during, you know, the misinformation crisis. This isn't really their goal with that. So, right, so there's going to be a bit of a gray area for us a little bit. Because this isn't peer reviewed, but it is directly from the CDC. So then you'll have to be the judge of where you sit with that. Interesting that when it comes to information about COVID-19, I actively look for information uh, from individuals and groups. Look at that, Dr. Bonnie Henry, 54%. That, I feel like that was an incredibly good result. They were probably really, really substantially happy with that. Um, Justin Trudeau, interesting. Uh, Dr. Teresa Tam, medical health officer for the country. Um, other healthcare professionals, 
John Horgan, again, the premier of BC at the time, uh, who uh, I, I only have met him once so far in my life, and he was a delightful person um, touting to me how awesome Bonnie Henry is. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, he seems cool. Uh, family members, certainly people will trust their circles. Um, friends. Politicians from other countries, that's interesting. Social media, celebrity influencer, there you go. Mayors of various jurisdictions, city council, band council, and then religious or spiritual leaders. So a lot of different sources of information, and that's definitely going to be uh, the rule in, in society. We are very, very multifaceted in a lot of ways. Um, and so again, keeping information in your head about where other information is being exchanged. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about taking uh, into account only favorable discoveries. Now, I love this, uh, this little infographic here, and in fact, I, I give this to my students uh, sometimes, and I'll get them to just recreate this again. What is a, a, a version of this that would work in your world, um, you know, whether your world is medically oriented or, or, um, or otherwise? Um, and so... Because uh, of only selecting favorable discoveries, your miracle cure is always going to work, et cetera, et cetera. 100% guaranteed. Uh, I mean, certainly a sale of something can be 100% guaranteed. That certainly doesn't mean the cure is, so check the writing. Um, and I guess this might be a good time as well to just talk briefly about this phenomenon that is really common in today's world, that is greenwashing. And that is when any company, government, <clears throat> um, provides information that sounds really good, but it's meant to sound good. That's, that's direct deceit, right? That's pseudoscience, that's actually a lie. It's the same thing. <laughs> okay, so we have to be really careful about companies that talk about things like biodiesel <laughs> and natural gas, you know, and Come on, is it carbon-based? Because if it's carbon-based, that's it. So careful for greenwashing. Oh my goodness, and those of us that are cognizant of the fashion world, um, that's tricky because young shoppers are incredibly impressionable and telling them that they're doing something good for the planet when they are directly not doing something good for the planet is pretty hard on their sense of self and self-esteem, and they get really confused by things like that. And that is actually what's happening out there. I wish it weren't the case. Uh, okay, let's see here. I like to talk about skepticism because I like audiences, students, colleagues, friends, to have a healthy skepticism. Um, when in doubt, go with skeptical especially in 2023, as you know, we are sort of bending uh, what we consider to be truth and not. Um, skepticism is, is, is not a set of beliefs. It's, it's simply about carefully considering the information in front of you. And certainly as scientists, we, that's what we're doing with peer review. We're trying to be skeptical about each other's work. And really, you know, when any of us probably are working on a project, we want somebody to try and, you know, throw eggs at you a little bit, right? Poke a hole in it, find the flaws so that I can be better. Uh, and that's what skepticism is. So we respect evidence uh, that supports or refutes evidence. Uh, without evidence, we are skeptical. Uh, we have, I, I did already touched on this, the verifiable versus our non-repeatable results. That, that scientific method is happening if it's good science. Aha, yes, and I want to talk briefly here too about accuracy and preci precision um, because they are often uh, misused and, and at the expense of good information sharing. Okay, so as scientists, we certainly want to be both accurate and precise. That would be great. Uh, precise being you are making a, a very specific measurement and accurate being that you are doing it correctly. Um, and then we have just examples there where you have each of the other things. 
I find that having a knowledge of, of what this is, is often helpful in approaching some of these media uh, pieces that are trying to mess with you on those exact things. Um, Yes, now, oh, uh, something to consider is that humans are always messy, and we're gonna talk a little bit about, um, yes, good, humans being messy in the sense of us having these enormous brains and there being so many factors in our lives. And this is part of why pseudoscience and misinformation gets as far as it does. Because, well, when in doubt, maybe. Um, so let's talk a little bit about qualitative data versus quantitative data. Qualitative data is data that is describable. Um, it is data that isn't necessarily numerically measured. So it's different from data that you might get in an experiment. However, the case study or the medical psychology study is always going to have a massive uh, part of uh, qualitative data associated with it because that is a huge part of how you understand what is wrong with somebody. They tell you, they explain it to you. That's not, you know, a, a level of some kind of thing we can measure. That's a qualitative thing. So when you are, you know, out there in your travels, consider whether you are looking at qualitative data or quantitative data. It matters in the context of explaining something clearly, especially if we are talking about pseudoscience, okay? So um, this, yeah, good. This is where we are having a huge issue with the transgender uh, argument, with the transgender uh, ideology sort of so-called battle that seems to be happening in, in the world. Um, and this comes up and this resonates for me massively. Uh, I am a school trustee in Chilliwack. And um, there's a lot of misinformation out there that is causing harm to children. And um, sadly, we are, we've had to move our lecture, or excuse me, our uh, meetings onto online because of it. Misinformation. So let's talk about transgender individuals. Remember at the very beginning of this lecture, how I talked about science learning more and science being willing to change? That is exactly what we are talking about with the transgender argument. We learned more because we got to a point in society where enough transgender people were able to find each other and, and speak to each other and understand each other in a way that they had never been understood before. I mean, and the power of the internet certainly played a big role in that. And because of that, you know, social movement, which absolutely began with qualitative data, we now have a massive collection of quantitative and scientific data that supports the identity of transgender individuals as well. Science learned more. Now we know. Thank you to the brave people who, described, who told us. Now we know. And now we have a set of learning resources that we've developed, right, in the province of BC. <laughs> you probably heard about it if you've, I don't know, live in BC uh, and are breathing. Um, it's controversial somehow. Why? Not controversial at all. There's people who believe in evidence-based factual information, and there's people who don't, and that's it. That's it. And this is tough, this is hard, because these conversations can be really nuanced, and young people are so impressionable. And so I'm sure that many of you have someone in your life that may be dealing with this or going through this. And, and I feel like talking about it in this kind of a framework is really helpful because it takes the emotion out. You know, I don't have to be invested in an emotion if I can just describe what I do, which is talk about these things called evidence-based and, you know, supported hypothesis. And blah, blah, blah. It's a really powerful way to just show information without any emotion attached to it. Um, and so, qualitative data 
can also, of course, be quantified in, in various ways. But having a combination of both of those things, especially as uh, our incredibly complex society proceeds, is very important. Um, we often see medical, psychological, dental, community data, uh, a really big combination of these things. Okay, I'm almost done. Oh, I'm almost done. A um, couple of additional helpful tips. Um, these are things that I have noticed that people sort of try to throw at me. Um, medical exceptions or anomalies. But wait a second. This person took this thing and they died. Right? You get that. You hear that. And maybe that's true. <laughs> and that's terrible and unfortunate. Um, there are many, many factors that may contribute or may have contributed to something like that. And that is not evidence. That is an unfortunate thing that happened. But certainly, as science goes, we couldn't possibly use one example or one anomaly to explain anything. Because now we already know science is already trying to kick its own butt. Like, science is already doing that to itself. Um, and so these anomalies come into it. They come into it with the transgender argument. I get it a lot of um, people who say things like, well, all the, these three people changed back. So they did. Great. Okay. That's it. That's not evidence. That's just an example. Okay. Um, media sources. Now we know. Good scientific sources, if you can get that primary literature, get it. If you can actually lay your eyes on that citation from that journal, get it. Verify it for yourself. Where is the data coming from? Uh, Cross-check, especially sometimes things, you know, that BCCDC thing, the link was broken, and I really wanted to know because I wanted to have it for this lecture and I couldn't find it. Um, Sometimes those missed links, and I'm not saying that's a, the case with the CDC, but sometimes a lot of those broken links are there quite purposefully. So you don't find what you're looking for, and then you give up real quick. That's purposeful. So don't forget to find the citation. Like seriously, become a citation jerk. <laughs> um, common sense matters. It does, I promise. Even in 2023, common sense matters. And I think that... You know, if, yeah, if it sounds ridiculous, it's absolutely not true. And I think that the more people who are simply having calm conversations about good exchange of information, a lot of the things we've talked about tonight, I, I think that's the, you know, among the very best things we can be doing in, in our age. Yes, common sense. Let's make common sense great again. That should be a, a slogan. Uh, and that's it. That's the end. Uh, thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to finish my cookie now. Yes, hello. Dr. Bondar, you've uh, gone into politics. <laughs> and I wonder how that might reflect or relate on your professional life and, and the clashes that you've obviously been through or the reverse enforcements that I hope you might also have been through. Thank you. It's aired, right? <laughs> Thanks for coming, Aired. I appreciate that. Um, that's a great question. <laughs> it's a timely one. But I would say, I would say that I feel so, so good about having conversations. <laughs> because of my scientific training and because of what I do for a living and because I'm just used to always relying on those very strong and clear principles, I have felt that's elevated my ability to serve. I hope it has. I have experienced my own material being misappropriated and misused against me and just finished a six day trial, uh, a defamation trial. I do not have a result, <laughs> but that, that was brutal. I didn't feel that was fair, which is why I proceeded with that. But that's it, that's all I got in this world, right? That's all I got, my voice, and I got a chance to say my story, and that matters to me, you know? And I think in that sense too, 
It makes me a better person. It makes me a stronger person. And so I think the, the political question is, is such a fascinating one because politicians are, wow, you know, it's hard to get anything right. <laughs> um, and yet I think the more real we can be and certainly the more clear we can be um, about where we stand on things, maybe the better. So I, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> certainly science communication makes it makes me good at speaking in meetings. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Any other questions? Yes, yes. Have you talked about the difference between evidence and examples? And I'm curious, just generally, when does it transfer from examples and become enough examples in yeah. science to say, maybe this is evidence? Does that make sense? Absolutely. Great question. So um, just in case not everyone heard, um, the difference between examples and evidence, or you know, the notion of um, when we have an idea that is supported by evidence, how much evidence do we need before we say, you know what, yeah, like we, we've got enough examples. Can we say something a little stronger about this thing we're saying? Is that sort of what you mean? Yeah. So I feel like there is, there is a, a gradation, I guess you could say, in the scientific literature about something, you know, sort of graduating from a hypothesis to a Oh gosh, I'm going to forget the, the steps, but you know, theory is one of the later steps. But what I would say before that is there are things called meta-analyses and also review articles. And so a very, very, very helpful thing, and actually I'm really glad you asked this question. I should add this to the talk. Um, a really helpful thing in the scientific literature are review papers. So if you have a field that you would like to get kind of a, a recent synthesis upon, Reading a review paper is super, super helpful for that. And that might also help to clarify how much other work is done on a particular topic. Um, and then uh, another way you can kind of get to that is databasing. I'm such a databasing nerd and I love it. It's so fun. Um, basically getting out there and searching. You can, you can do analyses looking at how many um, papers have a particular keyword in their title. Um, and, how, and you know which journals they came from, and then how many people cited those papers, all kinds of things to sort of verify the validity or the veracity of a particular piece of work. Yeah, great question, thank you. Yes, hi. Uh, a lot of scientific you know, information is found in the primary literature, yes. Yeah, excellent question. Um, how do we deal with this backlog when science needs results to, to happen? And yes, the, the race to a vaccine was a huge, you know, global petri dish example of that. Um, and that, you know, I wish I could tell you that peer review wasn't broken. <laughs> um, peer review is far from perfect. And a lot of academics will tell you it's very broken for reasons like that. Um, and also reasons like there are you know, far more prestigious journals, there are impact factors that measure how many people publish in various journals and how many people cite the papers in various journals and how many cite the sites and so on. And so there's very specific quantifiable measures that people then try to take advantage of to get really high scores. So yeah, things like that do happen. And, and so that's tricky. Where I would say we can do better there is with our medical and case study work. We can, and journalists too, scientific journalists who are collating individual smaller pieces for you. And also with that CDC piece, I'm sure they didn't publish it because of the time lag. And so in that case, they had decided made that you know, conscious choice. We are the CDC. This is who we are. This is what we publish. This is what we found. And they do have the power to do that. And then if they are you know, researching something proprietary, um, they can publish it after um, in that sense. But certainly, 
I hear you in that in that way, and it is not a perfect system at all. Yeah. Thank you. I wish I had a better <laughs> a better one. Although I would say open online access really changed the game. Um, when I was in grad school, when I was doing my PhD, you, you know, the average everyday person um, had to, well, and even a student had to go into the library, the sixth floor, that's where the journals were, and, you know, find your article, photocopy the piece, the pages that you wanted. Remember, I had the copy cards, and you'd leave, and you'd have, like, 18 pounds of paper in your backpack. Um, that's how we used to do it. That moved from um, having journals accessible online through your institution, which I would say the vast majority still are. They are not open access, but now there is another layer of that, which is open access. Instant, free, global, open access, and a lot of them are going in that way for that exact reason. So PLOS One was a journal in biology that was really uh, groundbreaking in that regard. And now, you know, I started writing my PhD from home. Uh, that, gosh, that was all the way back in 07. But that was amazing for me because libraries had just put their journals online. So, you know, we're getting there, I guess, <laughs> slowly. <laughs> yes? One of your last slides uh, made the comment that uh, common sense uh, is a good test of whether something is probably true or not. Uh, one of my observations, uh, particularly in the field of politics and U.S. politics, oh. is common sense seems to have withered on the vine. And you know you hear things and you wonder, how could anyone believe that? Yet, why do you think that's becoming more of a, a prevalent problem? Such a fascinating question. And I think about this a lot. I'm sure a lot of us do. <laughs> um, and I, I, I see it now, right? Like I, you can see the, the sort of the US government shutdowns, their inability to send aid to basically function as a country is currently jeopardized. We are currently looking at the aftermath of what happens when people without common sense have positions of power. And um, I think that, at least for me, w what it makes me want to do is just shout good information <laughs> from the rooftops. And, uh, and I do. Um, I would also say it's important for us to do that. In society, I think, you know, for, for the, well, since society's kind of been society, it's been okay to let people have a pass who sort of, you know, have different views than you or, you know, grandmas at the, or whatever the thing may be. But it's like, I struggle with that because if we are not recognizing human rights of people, if we are not exercising our power of basic decency as humans, that's a problem. And I think we need to do a better job, all of us, day to day, of, of not necessarily being mad, but just being like, hey, I don't think that that's true because you know this is the thing I got. And I know this because I learned it from, from a scientific paper. That's it, friendly conversations. It's the only way we're gonna get through this. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I really worry. I see, you know, as a school trustee, I see American politicians whose entire election campaigns are based upon making sports safe for girls again. Wow. Wow. I don't, I don't know what to say about that. Wow. Yeah, so, but, but state of the world, right? We can do better. We can do better. We can simply say, no, we won't do that here. That's it, yeah, thank you. Um, any other questions? Great questions, yeah. Yes? Um, how do we, in this quote, truth, address people who don't care as much about science as maybe what their own personal beliefs are? Yeah, so the question is how do we, how do we engage with people who, who really don't, don't care, may not want to even partake in science, that their beliefs uh, trump that? I don't think we can. I, I think it's tricky, and I think we've got to pick our battles. Um, I think living well and, and living by example is, you know, in, in this mess, in this muddle, it's all we got. Um, and so, you know, even 
I take it all the way from misinformation, pseudoscience, but even when I do things like, you know, s skip meat <laughs> and like take the bus, like anything for climate, climate science for the good of society, all those little things that you do every day, that matters in you somehow, right? Like, and so if you feel icky at the end of the day, maybe you didn't show up for yourself, you know? And I, I yeah, so how, I don't think we can change people's beliefs and that's, a, that's tricky, wow. I think that's probably the root of, of much of the world's conflict. Um, but we can live well and hopefully just show by example. Yeah, great question though, thank you. And if anyone has questions, I'm certainly send me an email. Um, if that's my name, karenbonner.gmail.com or my UFE address. Yeah, thank you so much for coming tonight. Oh, it was a pleasure to share some space with you. Thank you.